everyone. Welcome to Thoro Newspaper Analysis, which is brought to you by Law Seco. So today we'll be discussing three articles. The first one is from the Hindu, which is titled as Academic and the Free Will, Academia and the Free Will. So basically it discusses as to how much freedom of choosing what to study and how thoroughly can we discuss it on social platforms without any fear from the state or any other authority. How much of that do we have in India and where actually are we faring in this uh, regard? Secondly, what Mandal missed, this is from the Indian Express and it talks about the uh, reservation system and the various outcomes of the reservation system, specifically if we talk about the state of Bihar. And thirdly, we have let law not do them part, which is again from the Indian Express. It talks about the equal rights of marriage for the LGBT and Q community. So that uh, it is very much constitutional and it is... Uh, you know, equality in the real sense to provide um, um, equal rights to marriage to them as well. And on fourth, we have the news in flash, wherein we'll be discussing the small and crisp news points, which are more important for our prelims exam. So if you are also preparing for judicial services exam, you can definitely have a look at our course for you. We have the Lord of the Courses, which is the Judiciary Test Prep course. So the link is there in the description box. It is very amazingly drafted with all the modules that would, you would require for a very good preparation. You can download free study material also for yourself. Then you can have a look at various other courses like we have CLAT, uh, All India Bar Exam, SEBI, etc. They're also all available on the Law Seco page. So let's see, what do we have for the multiple choice question today? Go Electric campaign started in which of the following Indian states? First, Madhya Pradesh. Second, Tamil Nadu. Third, Andhra Pradesh. Or fourth, Goa. You can jot down the correct answer in the comment section below. So this is the descriptive question for the day. Our values don't recognize same-sex marriage. How far is the statement justified in the Indian context? Critically analyze. And as I had already told you that wherever this term critically is there, you need to uh, basically uh, evaluate a given statement, keeping in mind the pros as well as cons, that is merits and demerits of that particular statement. Like for example, here is that our values don't recognize same-sex marriages. So you have to write contentions from both the sides favoring the thing and also, uh, you know, retaliating the same thing. With this, let's start with the first article for the day, which talks about academia and free will. So India has scored considerably low in the International Academic Freedom Index 2020. So this is also called as the AFI and India has scored 0.352. So political tension in India Political brutality against students in Jamia Milia and JNU is a very big example of that. And before we understand it into a deeper length, let's understand as to what the AFI, that is the Academic Freedom Index is, and what are the major eight components upon which this index is, or this report, or this entire evaluation is done. So here, the, it quantifies freedom of scholars to discuss politically and culturally the controversial topics. Now, these can be any topics, be it related to, for example, if you talk about reservation, it can be related to, just like we are discussing today as well, the equal rights for marriage or same-sex uh, marriages or any, any controversial topics for that matter, like it can be anything, like for example, the Sabri Mala judgment as well. So it should give, if you are academically free or you have the academic freedom in, in your country, so you would be safe and you would be very free to discuss politically and uh, to discuss the politically and culturally controversial topics. A very common example of this can also be like interfaith or intercaste, interreligion marriages as well, without fearing of for life, studies or profession. Just very recently, as we you know uh, saw that uh, many a times when people tend to take a note that is different from what society thinks or believes into what is taboo for the society. Many times those people are threatened by the, you know, so-called stakeholders of the society who do not want uh, people to think a um, certain way. And that is why if we have any kind of fear for our life or our studies or profession, and we're not able to discuss the uh, sensitive issues or the controversial topics freely into the society, then we are not, uh, we do not have what we call as the academia or academic freedom uh, in our country. And similar is the situation that has come up where India has scored such low uh, in the um, 
in this uh, entire uh, index and even countries like malaysia pakistan brazil somalia now please just consider here somalia is one country that already is under so much of turmoil due to terrorism and various other you know there is no political stability over there but yet the people over there or the scholars over there have a greater uh, you know a freedom of uh, putting out their own views and ideas without your at least with a lesser fear as what the scholars in india have and ukraine so these countries have actually scored better than india and even if we take example for pakistan as well it is considered to be a theological state which is not so tolerant not so not at all secular and not so uh, you know accommodating in nature but yet the scholars over there have a greater freedom of expression than uh, those in india and the toppers of this uh, index for uruguay and portugal so these are the eight parameters that on which the uh, afi or the academic freedom index is based upon firstly freedom to research and teach so you can research into any subject and you can teach any subject of your choice second freedom of academic exchange and dissemination that how easily can you exchange your ideas with the other person other scholar or at any other platform and how easily and efficiently you can disseminate or you know propagate what you know thirdly institutional autonomy wherein the colleges and universities have some autonomy for their functionality fourthly campus integrity that how nicely the uh, different uh, aspects of the different areas of a campus like for example the uh, there can be anything for example co curricular activities with the main learning methods there with the practical learning as well then outsourcing as well so all these things how well are they integrated in a particular campus next freedom of academic and cultural expression which we just discussed that how freely can you discuss about any controversial issue uh, without having any kind of fear of you know losing your studies or profession or your life sixthly constitutional protection of academic freedom because obviously only then uh, we can uh, think of realizing it in the real sense that we have some uh, academic freedom only when we have some constitutional protection or backing behind it seventh international legal commitment to academic freedom under international covenant on economic social and cultural rights so like how much are we uh, committing ourselves to meet the standards of the world class education or the world or the international standards of education and of freedom of um, academics and finally on the eighth we have existence of universities because obviously universities colleges and such educational institutions are the key elements in um, teaching or you know in educating any country so that now the ones here the four uh, aspects or the four components in the ones that are highlighted here are the ones in which india has performed severely bad as in uh, we have done still fine in the um, in number 1 2 7 and 8 but in these four institutional autonomy we have a lot of interference coming from the political uh, bodies or the political uh, you know uh, setups of political people then we do not have campus integrity in india then freedom of academic and cultural expression all of us know because nowadays you tend to speak something that the state does not like you're directly put up with the charge of sedition under section 124a of the indian penal code and then constitutional protection of academic freedom obviously we do not really have we do not really have any kind of such legislative or constitutional protection so uh, in this scenario the national education policy 2020 by for many people uh, seems to bring some hope of light that it would uh, help india to perform better in all the eight components and it would help us ensure that we are performing better in the academic freedom index so the nep 2020 is based on principles of creativity and critical thinking as we had also discussed in the very you know, earlier sessions so it envisions an education system that is free from political or external interference this would help us uh, fight with this uh, problem of uh, institutional autonomy and uh, problem as in uh, we would it would help ensure uh, institutional autonomy wherein we would see less interference in the education system from the political and external in our sides then faculty will be given freedom to design their own curricular and pedagogical approaches within a pr uh, approved framework so this was uh, that would again uh, given the institutional autonomy as well as campus integrity as well and then suggest constituting a national research foundation which would inculcate a better uh, approach and also a better aptitude towards research and development then uh, it aims to debureaucratize the education system giving them governing powers so the very bodies that actually are there in the colleges and institutions they would be given the governing powers instead of you know bureaucratizing because 
many a times all these bodies are currently governed or presided by various civil servants mostly ias and other uh, ies you know education of office, officers or something like that but now uh, in the national education policy is planning to debureaucratize the entire system so that even the political interference can be lessened to a great extent so it would help uh, the board comprising uh, academicians and it would reduce political interference as well so uh, we really hope that it would really bring a hope of light to the entire education system in india and make it more autonomous and also more practical in the real sense with this let's discuss the second article for the day which talks about lower castes in bihar political and economic power now here uh, it is a very nice uh, study or a very nice evaluation that has been made keeping in mind the bihar uh, the situation of bihar in the current scenario wherein it said uh, that uh, bihar was basically the first laboratory now what place is a laboratory where some experiment goes on so it was the first laboratory it was the first state wherein the experiment of positive discrimination in the hindi belt actually took place so hindi belt as in the hindi speaking belt mostly in the northern india so over there bihar was the first state wherein the reservation system was uh, most extensively um, uh, put up and it was uh, experimented for the first time in this state so it initiated the reservation policies back in 1970s itself under the kapuri thakur and bp mandal uh, and it was bp mandal who actually uh, under whom the mandal commission was also set up uh, after you know in 1979 wherein the morarji desai was the um, a president of india and at that time it was set up to look into as to what are the people who are socially and educationally backward in the country and who need this positive discrimination so basically bihar was the first state to have uh, put up the recommendations of the mandal commission and that is why we also use the terms you might we might cover it in uh, today's uh, discussion as well of the mandalization wherein you know a uh, more and more power is sought to be given to the lower caste or the obcs and other uh, dalits in the state so the current status of lower caste in bihar is that they have political power and this is a very nice uh, you know dilemma or in a way a kind of um, very different uh, situation that we are seeing in here that having a uh, being you know uh, one of the primary states for uh, bringing in the reservation system and uh, all these positive discrimination steps bihar has made it quite possible and it has, it is actually given a lot of political power to the lower caste in the in the state but on the contrary the economic power and also the final final power of governing or uh, you know administering is still with the upper caste people so in a way if we look into a you know uh, like superficially like uh, if you look generally from the outer side it really appears that the obcs or the um, lower caste people in bihar, the state of bihar have a lot of political power and that is why they must be having a lot of economic strength and other all educational um, facilities etc and so on and so forth but in the real sense it is just the opposite so the lower caste people in bihar have a lot of political power but on the contrary they do not have a lot of economic power as in still the major lands uh, are the, the major part of the land as is still owned by the upper caste people and other uh, other kinds of economic resources are also governed totally like in majority by the upper caste people so they have a political power so like if we talk about the lower caste they have political power in 1995 elections obcs were 44% of mlas from the states of which 26% were of yadavas and in 2000 elections obc were 50% of the total mlas and only 13% of them were uh, like uh, of the total mlas were of upper caste but if we talk about the economic surplus and bureaucratic rule as well like, like in, even in the field of ias and other bureaucratic bureaucratic posts also they are held majorly by the upper caste people so if we talk about the economy or the bureaucratic rule it still remains with the upper caste so according to the indian human development survey 2011 12 10% of yadavas 9% kurmis and 8.9% of paswans and 7.7% jatwas uh, had jobs brahmins topped the, so it was the brahmins who topped uh, average per capita income uh, at rupees 28000 approximately as compared to yadavs and that, that they were uh, and they were only at rupees 12000 approx and brahmins topped the uh, percentage of graduates as well which was 7.4% as compared to yadavas so if we talk about economy like here we'll say um, according to the uh, this integrated human development survey itself upper caste control most land in the rural society and 
if you talk about the other jobs like 74% of the ias officers from bihar were from the upper caste so if we talk about education if we talk about economy and if we talk about the bureaucratic rule as well it is still the upper caste that is ruling so just in the in the terms of political power this has been um, you know um, a good news for the lower caste people but not nowhere else than this so that is why it is um, the very title says that where the mandal commission has basically failed so the very purpose of providing this a uh, mandal commission or you know providing this positive discrimination or the reservation uh, system to the lower caste people or the oppressed classes was that they not only held uh, you know they not, they're not only given representation in the political power but also in other fields like economy education social empowerment growth uh, jobs etc but the only thing that they have been able to avail till date is just the political power and nothing more than that so this is something that we need to work upon and maybe overhauling of these policies needs to be done to give an equal share of everything to everybody with this let's discuss the last article for the day which talks about same sex marriages so recently three couples have filed petitions in delhi high court and kerala high court arguing that the state's refusal to recognize their marriages violates their constitutional rights now as we know that uh, very recently uh, section 377 of the indian penal code that actually earlier criminalized the same sex or the homosexuality similarly uh, basically so it was uh, decriminalized so in a way now it is not a criminal offense to be in love with somebody though it is it hardly makes any sense that being love in lo being in love with somebody can actually be a criminal offense but yes unfortunately in india it was uh, till the date uh, six uh, 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 section 377 was not struck down but fortunately we have it uh, we have gotten it decriminalized for the date but the other irony that lies in this fair is that at one side you are decriminalizing the love between the same sex but you're not recognizing the marriage uh, between the same sex people so this is something really like you know um, giving a right in a very hypothetical manner and in a way that they would feel that they have a particular right but in the practical and real sense they have actually no right in equality as to other normal couple normal as in according to the law which what we consider normal like a male and a female marriage simple marriage but if you are really normalizing yourself with the concept of homosexuality as well it is ideal that you also give them equal rights to actually realize the very idea of getting into a marriage and actually behaving and living in like real couples do so uh, recently the solicitor general of uh, india tushar mehta he said that uh, same sex marriages is against the indian values so due to some believes they do uh, believe in this concept but really if we talk about modernizing the world and moving towards a egalitarian society it hardly holds any good uh, you know contention or any good argument that same sex marriages are just not uh, you know with the indian values or something or they pollute the indian values or something so trust me it's uh, according to what what i interpret is that is just love and nothing else so it should be given equal respect and value as other kinds of love marriages of other marriages as well so here is a very important case law which we all know about so it was navdeep singh johar and others versus union of india in which and actually it was decriminalized so it was said that the choice of uh, whom to partner the ability to find fulfillment in sexual intimacies and the right to not to be subject to discriminatory behavior are intrinsic to the constitutional protection of sexual orientation now let's understand about that if really the same sex marriages are against the indian values that we so proudly uh, you know talk about so as per the book loves right uh, same sex marriages in modern india uh, the which the author uh, itself you know, she herself has written this book hundreds of such cases were examined so almost all of them came from non english speaking and lower income backgrounds because see many a times you would be talking about people uh, talking to people about homosexuality most of those people who are really not aware of anything and just have to comment upon thing what they would tend to say is that this is something which has come due to westernization we have moved towards the western societies this is some some peril that is coming from the western societies but if we talk about indian and indian people and the most of those who actually want to get married and are into at least they are recognizing their homosexual relationships most of them come from non english speaking backgrounds and the lower income backgrounds which uh, who generally do not have anything to do with the western culture or they, they are not even aware about the western culture but yet they practice homosexuality 
so they got married by religious uh, rituals and committed joint suicide many of them they came from all over india all religions and all classes so it has got nothing really to do with any class your education system if if or not you're educated or not and if you belong to a particular religion or not it is something it's just a sexual orientation and it comes to you biologically so nothing in this world can really tamper or can really you know change it about change anything about it because it is something biological so you can't really you know fight with the nature about anything so most of them never heard the words gay or lesbian so this is the very thing that we should pay attention towards that most of these people who at least have been quoted in this book they didn't even know the terms that if they are like a man is loving a man so he actually is called a gay in the normal you know conversational language or a woman loving a woman is called a lesbian they just loved each other at uh, each each other which means that there was no as such influence of any kind of open education or co education then you know as they quoted to be a negative influence of these things or of the western culture to say for that matter now this is the basic a very small chronological chronological history that has been given about section 377 so as we know that the indian penal code is from the 1860 and it was brought into effect back then then 2001 nas foundation which is an ngo basically challenged the constitutionality of section 377 before delhi high court then uh, in 2003 delhi high court dismissed the nas plea and uh, it, then it actually you know it reconsidered it in 2009 delhi high court had struck down 377 but if you remember it was uh, not struck down it was you know upheld back again by the supreme court but then in 2013 the supreme court and yes in 2013 it recriminalized the homosexuality so though delhi high court back in 2009 itself had decriminalized it but when it went into appeal in 2013 the supreme court again it criminalized the homosexuality then in 2015 lok sabha rejected shashi tharoor's bills uh, bill which actually he said uh, he had again proposed a bill to decriminalize homosexuality but it was again uh, you know uh, struck down in the um, uh, parliament and then 2016 five petitioners challenged three, section 377 before supreme court and 2017 supreme court recognizes fundamental right to privacy and 2018 it was finally struck down so it was a very hard and a very long journey and due to through which a uh, section 377 was finally taken out from the ipc and it was decriminalized then uh, there are some other uh, historical books and texts also which are available from india so katha sarit sagar which is a sanskrit text from the 11th century even that now can you date it back it is from the 11th century even that provides for the explanation of cross class and cross caste couples who want to marry and uh, it, it, there are also various instances wherein and the the marriages that were taking place so they had a word with the swamis or the hindu priests who actually got these marriages performed so they said that atma or the spirit has no gender basically right so marriage is a union of spirits it's a union of atmas and it does not really matter as to bodily wise or like a, like in the concrete or in the corporeal sense who you are like a man or a woman it is the soul that connects to the other soul and you can't really help much about it and then even in other countries there were demands for marriage equality that came from the ordinary people and not from the lgbt uh, movement but the ordinary people were those who actually demanded equal rights for the other like the lgbts as well and 1971 first same sex marriage was registered in the us so the way forward that we have for is this is that we should join such democracies that actually recognize the same sex marriages for uh, unformed application like for example if we talk about us itself so it recognizes not only homosexuality but also same sex marriages and the very uh, you know uh, idea behind this is that uh, the people who uh, like by religious sense they have gotten married but uh, the law does not recognize their marriage so it makes it very it's it makes it very confusing because if in case they have to get any joint uh, account open they cannot really do that like in the name of spouses they cannot if they have to uh, like if one person uh, unfortunately dies then the other cannot even claim the body of that person you know like the relatives generally do but in the same sex marriages unless they recognize in india that legalized in india the person cannot even claim the body of his or her partner and also there are other instances like they cannot you know avail a common health insurance and various other schemes that, that are just available to a male and a female spouse kind of idea they are not available to the same sex couples so that is why it is really important in the constitutional sense as well to provide equal rights to all these people and uh, we should if we are at all respecting their love then we should also make efforts to give them this very recognition of their love as a 
from a couple. So finally, we have the news in flash, which talks about the Go Electric campaign. So the Andhra Pradesh government has decided to establish 400 charging stations across the state in the first phase to attract investments to the sector by stacking, stepping up uh, the efforts to set up electric vehicle infrastructure. Now, as we know, we are moving towards a greener economy and we want to curb down the uh, emissions of the carbon and we want to bring down the global uh, you know, uh, temperature at least by two degrees, uh, keeping in mind the Paris Agreement. So electric vehicles are a very good thing that we should invest into. And this is a very good step and forward step taken in this regard. So the campaign was organized by Andhra Pradesh State Energy Conservation Mission. So this was all for today. We hope it was a good session for you. Stay tuned with Law Seco for such more sessions to come. Thank you so much.